Hi, everyone, and welcome to our podcast about anxiety, obsessive compulsive, and trauma related disorders. So, like we talked about in class, right? Um, you know, there's lots of different types of disorders that are that existence in the DSM 5, and um, obsessive compulsive and trauma related used to be lumped in with anxiety in the old DSM, but now they've split them up a little bit, but they do have some similar symptoms, which is why I'm going to talk about them together. So anxiety disorders, right? What is the baseline of an anxiety disorder? It is d- distressing persistent anxiety um, or dysfunctional anxiety reducing behaviors, right? And all of us, right, we talked about this, all of us have a little bit of anxiety or all of us worry about things, right? But this is the idea that it becomes dysfunctional in your life. So there's three types of anxiety disorders. There's generalized anxiety disorder, also called GAD. There's phobias, which I'm sure many of you have heard of before. And then there's panic disorders. Um, and then, like I said, there used to be, in, in this category, used to be obsessive compulsive disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder. But now they've separated those two categories or those two disorders into their own categories. So although they still involve anxiety responses, there's now a separate category. So what is generalized anxiety disorder? Well, it's kind of like what it seems in that your anxiety is generalized, right? It's persistent, uncontrollable, tenseness, worry, apprehension, and they call it this free-floating anxiety because you almost don't, you don't even know what you're worried about, but you're always worried. So you can't even, you can't place it. You can't say like, oh, I'm worried about this test I have. It's just like this intense fear that something is going to happen. You have a very hard time concentrating. Um, you end up being jittery, agitated, which also then can lead you to be sleep deprived. And like I said, it's, you know, not that all of us don't have days where we're worried and we're just like, what do you worry? I don't know. I just worried. I'm nervous, right? But this is six months or more of this behavior. And the behavior then becomes dysfunctional, right? So it makes it hard for them to go to work, to, to you know, their marriage or their um, family or, you know, what a school, any of these things are impacted by this anxiety that allows them to not be functional. So the next one is panic disorder, okay? And the same, the symptom of a panic disorder is a panic attack, the main symptom. So when panic attacks are sh- much shorter, right? So with generalized anxiety disorder, it's worry, fear, nervousness all the time. With panic attack, it's much more acute episodes, right? They're minute long, so maybe a minute, two minutes, episodes of intense fear, right? So terror, chest pains, people kind of describe it as like a heart attack. They feel like they're choking, okay? And it comes on very suddenly, kind of takes over your entire body and then leaves again almost just as suddenly, right? And in order for you to have a panic disorder, you have to have two or more panic attacks in a six-month period. Um, And this also, like having these panic attacks can be linked with another disorder. It can eventually cause the person to be afraid of going outside in like a wide open space and not being able to um, get help or not being feeling out of control when they have that attack. And so then the disorder of agoraphobia, which is a fear of open spaces, can be linked with panic disorder, okay? So speaking of agoraphobia, right, that leads us to phobias. And, you know, we've heard a lot about phobias. We throw this word a word a lot around in culture. Oh, I have a phobia of spiders. I have a phobia, whatever, right? So what's the difference between being scared and having a phobia? Because I'm telling you something, I'm afraid of bugs, but I don't have a phobia, right? So you have the marked, persistent, irrational fear of an object or situation that disrupts your behavior, okay? So I don't like animal, or I mean, I love animals. I don't like bugs, but that doesn't prevent me from going into nature, right? So if you if it disrupts your behavior and causes you to change your whole pattern of, of living to avoid this thing or this object, this idea, this concept, whatever it is, then it goes from a normal fear to a phobia, right? And this is just a little diagram right here of the different things that people are afraid of. Um, and even though, you know, this a fear is like legitimate, but then the phobia, you know, is when it takes it over to the next um, step, right? Takes it beyond just a fear to impacting your daily life. So what are two common phobias? The first one um, is called social anxiety disorder. And this is different than a normal phobia because a normal phobia is like a fear of something. It's like a stimulus, like a spider or um, a snake or something, right? So social anxiety disorder used to be called social phobia is like shyness to the extreme. So it's not a fear of something specific, a stimulus. It's a fear of like an overwhelming uh, situation, right? So you fear scrutiny, scrutiny from others and you try to avoid at all costs potentially embarrassing situations, including speaking in front of others or any kind of group outing. 
The second um, common phobia I mentioned already is agoraphobia. So this is a fear or a avoidance in situation in which you can't escape or escaping might be difficult. So you end up fearing crowds, large open spaces where you like don't know if you can like a mall, right? Where you just like don't know where you'd go to get help, um, elevators, um, so it kind of like is a situation where you feel like you can't escape. Um, and then this can be linked up with a panic attack because you're worried about having a panic attack when you can't escape. So that's some more phobias. Phobia of heights, closed spaces, uh, hemophobia, which is the phobia of blood, right? Just a couple other ones. Okay, so now moving on to obsessive compulsive disorders. So obsessive compulsive disorders, they include basic OCD, and then a subset of that hoarding, and then a few others, but those are the ones we're going to focus on. So obsessive compulsive has two parts, obsessive and compulsive. The obsessions is the persistent unwanted thoughts. I have to do this. I must do this. Checking, counting, any of those things. Then the compulsion is the ritual. So it's the checking of the lock, but the actual moving of it, or it's the washing of your hands, or it's the tapping of things, right? So you have the thoughts and the actions, right? And here's some examples of different thoughts and actions that people may experience through their repetitive thoughts and repetitive behaviors. And if you can see this um, brain image here, it's a PET scan of a person with OCD, and you see that they have a lot of activity in the frontal lobe, which is where they're directing their attention. So it's almost like their brain is hyper vigilant to um, like paying attention to small details and small like things that you might otherwise just move on from, right? So all of us have that moment where we're like, oh shoot, did I lock the door? But that moment doesn't take over your life and you don't think about it the rest of the day. But, or all of us have a little bit where we either maybe like to put things in a certain order. I know I have a certain study space. I like my way to, when I, when I study, I like everything to have its place. But it doesn't control me. Um, and that's how we, you know, we see in their brain that areas that don't get as much blood flow or as much metabolic activity in a normal brain is different in an OCD brain. So hoarding disorder, like I said, is a part of OCD. Um, it's 2 to 5% of the population. So I know it's like super like pop culture on TV, right? Um, and you think it's everywhere, but it's not. Um, it's not the same as collecting because collecting is a specific item. It's excessively saving items that others feel would be useless. Um, they have a hard time parting with items they already own. And the clutter disrupts their living and workspace, right? So we've all heard of pack rats, right? And basically, you know, the idea that people like to keep things. So this is that to the extreme, right? Like with any disorder, it's taking a mildly, you know, maybe just weird human behavior and making it to the extreme so it becomes dysfunctional. Okay, the next one, post-traumatic stress disorder is in a category called trauma-related disorders, okay? And it's four or more weeks of the following symptoms. Flashbacks of the event, nightmares, social anxiety or social withdrawal, jumpy anxiety, and sleep problems. And this often comes, we think of, with soldiers, but it can come after sexual assault. Um, some people experience it after 9-11. So it can come after any trauma. But something that I want to point out is that about one half of people, like 50% of people experience a trauma in their lifetime, and only about 10% of women and 20% of men actually develop PTSD. So it's not that like every, you know, there is some truth to the idea that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. There's this thing called post-traumatic growth, which is like a positive psycho psychological change as a result of struggling um, and having a challenging circumstance. Examples of this are Holocaust survivors who showed remarkable resilience um, in all world, all the world's religions talk about trauma as a way for growth. So it's not that everyone who goes through trauma gets PTSD. Which then, of course, means that we know that it has to be linked to something else too, right? Some sort of biological component. So Freud thought that anxiety disorders were due to our repression, our ego, superego, right? But here's some things that we think about today. So in the learning perspective, the classical conditioning, if you remember all the way back to behavioral, right? That people learn the fear, right? They learn to connect the anxiety with a certain stimuli or a certain response. And then they learn to fear that concept, right? And then they generalize that fear to a wider variety of things. You see operant conditioning here in that if I'm scared of something and if I avoid it, I feel better. So that avoidant behavior is reinforced, right? And then also observational learning. So you don't actually have to experience it in order to fear it. They found that if monkeys like learn to be afraid of snakes, if their parents avoid them, if they see their parents like avoiding food by snakes, or if they see other monkeys afraid of snakes, they can learn the behavior. 
And then the biological perspective talks about natural selection. So there are some things that are easier for us to become afraid of than others. Um, and that's from an evolutionary standpoint. Obviously, snakes, spiders, those kinds of things can be dangerous. And then genetics, like I already mentioned. So twin studies show that even if identical twins have never met each other, they can still share phobias, which is kind of crazy, right? Um, temperament. So some of us are born, like we talked about difficult babies, naturally a little bit more high strong and sensitive. Um, our nervous system is more reactive. And so that then can be impacted by your environment, can cause something like PTSD or OCD that no one else, someone else might not have that reaction. And then your genes. So your genes impact your level of neurotransmitters and serotonin and glutamate are two neurotransmitters that they think um, people with anxiety disorders may have an imbalance in. So that's all for now, AP Psychos. And remember, psychology is flipping awesome.